the, the Greater West Roxbury chapter of the John Birch Society. And uh, the program is uh, Behind the Marathon, the Boston Marathon Bombing. And uh, really quickly, I think most of us can remember where we were when that happened. And uh, I remember more vividly the few days later on April 19th of that year when uh, I was, uh, it was my job to pick up Larry Pratt of the Gun Owners of America and take him to the uh, Lexington Green. And I got a call from Randy, the gentleman who was hosting the, pres uh, the program, and he said, uh, there's been some, uh, this is like five in the morning, and there's been some kind of incident in Boston and uh, these two people, that's just the suspects in the bombing, were at large, one was killed and what have you, and that we were sheltering in place. Now, I didn't know what that term meant, yeah. but I was my immediate, immediate thought was that there must have been all these cells, these, these militant <laughs> Muslim cells erupting all over Greater Boston. <laughs> then I realized it was just one guy who was wounded. Now, one guy wounded can do a lot of damage. But you don't have to shut down uh, Greater Boston. Yeah. So we got to the airport. I had Dan McGonagall and I a few other uh, a few other people with me, and uh, it was like Sunday morning. It was a Friday, but it was dead. And we got to be picked up Larry, and we couldn't get on Cambridge Memorial Drive. It was shut down, and uh, we took I took some back roads to get to the uh, Lexington Green. Larry has never been on Lexington Green, so we said let's take a little. And we met with Tom Moore there and Garrett Lear. And about 30 or 40 policemen converged on us. You can't go on Lexington Green. Somehow the, what happened in Boston is somehow related to this issue. Yeah, it was kind of very eerie and uncanny. So um, anyway, um, I got to meet uh, Father Carl, unrelated. He were Facebook friends, and he was interested in this Article 5 issue, why, we, why it's a bad idea. We became friends, met with him. And he told me that he had, some, uh, he had done some research. He, had, uh, he worked, used to work for WorldNet Daily. He's oh, also sure. the pastor of Christ the King Church. He's an Episcopal priest. Uh, charismatic Episcopal. Charismatic Episcopal, thank you. Even and he's a conservative, so a conservative Episcopal. We're a conservative denomination. Yes. So, oh, wow. Yeah, so, uh, so I know some of you just wanted to see that. There's actually an Episcopal person that's conservative. That, there's one of this. Well, yeah, a few of them, yeah. Anyway, I'm just going to turn it over to, uh, to Father Carl. This is his first time he's done this presentation. Uh, hopefully we'll get the tech uh, squared away next time, and we'd like to maybe take this sort of show on the road uh, and get some other, you know, so, you we'll just, you know so let's give a nice warm hand to... Well, as Hal told you, I'm Father Michael Carl, and I'm the priest at Christ the King Church in Wakefield, Massachusetts. And we got, we did get acquainted through the Article 5 issue, you know, and I've been putting posts up there saying it's really a dumb idea, mm -hmm. because George Soros is funding efforts to push for a convention. Oh, I didn't know that. And so mm -hmm. that too. <laughs> the libs are just waiting in the wings for us to be dumb enough to go for that idea, and then they'll rush in and take over. Oh, and then right. the Constitution will be no more. Yeah. So I, you know, I've been trying to warn everybody about that, but you got the zealots Thank who you. think that's the only way to stop Obama. And I said, wait a minute, yeah. he's not paying attention to this Constitution. What makes you think he's going to pay attention to any new amendments too, either? Thank so anyway. You. And I also have my own little story to go along with complications with the Boston bombing. Because World Net Daily had sent me to Philadelphia on April 16th, or the 17th. And I was trying to take a train home on that Friday to get home. But that's when the city was on lockdown, so I had an extra night in Philadelphia, courtesy of Jokar and Tamerlan Sarnaya. And I said, the Boston Strong thing is a crock. Also, all it shows is that everybody was afraid. Thank you. You look at you look at the pictures from that, and you've got the armored cars rolling through the town, and there's infant well policemen around it, but it looks like infantry surrounding the tanks when they're entering the Pas de Calais on D-Day. You know, so it looked pretty stupid to me. So thank you. And especially they're chasing one guy. Right. You know, Boston Strong. Horse manure. All that showed is that Boston is afraid of terrorism. Yep. Now, that's nothing to take lightly, believe me. Now, <coughs> since we're going to have to do this the old-fashioned way, I'm going to have to show you the pictures from my notebook. And this is the Behind the Marathon Bomb. This, if you do not know, is the mosque that's in Somerville, between Cambridge and the main square on Somerville. And this is the place where Jokar and Tamerlan Sarnaev supposedly attended. Now, 
for the record, the term for a mosque is masjid. So if we're going to talk about Islam, let's do it from the point of view of having some factual knowledge so we don't all sound like... Uh, Americans. Huh? Americans. <laughs> Americans. Or in, in, see, I'm from I'm from Texas, so I was thinking redneck kids. But anyway, so we need to sound like we know what we're talking about. And by the way, the name of their holy book is called the Quran, spelled with Q U R apostrophe A N. It's not properly spelled K O R A N like you formally see it. Now, this mosque in Somerville is operated by the Islamic Society of Boston, which is an offshoot of the Muslim American Society. Does anybody know who started the Muslim American Society? Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood is the parent organization of the Muslim American Society, the Islamic Society of North America, the International Institute of Islamic Thought, <coughs> the Islamic Circle of North America, and the Muslim Students Association. And you also know who started the Muslim Brotherhood? CIA. Obama's no. brother? I don't no, know. No, no, no. Hamas. Hamas. I'll just threw that out there. The Muslim Brotherhood <laughs> is started by the terrorist organization that shoots rockets into Israel on a daily basis. Oh. Who started Hamas? Uh, and the Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas started the Muslim Brotherhood. Actually, no, Muslim Brotherhood started Hamas, excuse me, because the Muslim Brotherhood was started in 1926 by a guy named Hassan al -Bana. but we'll talk more about him How in a minute. How do you know that they started the Hamas? Because the board of directors of Hamas is the founding board of directors, or the Muslim Brotherhood are connected. They're all the officers of the groups of the is same. It, is there a possibility that, that some group like maybe uh, ISIS, so, I mean, when I say ISIS, meaning the Israel secret Intelligence Service or Mossad we'll, we'll uh, we'll manufactured this group, this opposition oh. group called Hamas. Well, we'll we'll talk about that. In, uh, I, mean, I hope so. Speak, all right, because that's a that's a distinct possibility. Yeah. Well, there's all kinds of stuff that could be possibilities, but at the moment, we got these chaps here who attended this mosque. Now, that takes us to this mosque that's at Roxbury Crossing which was built on land that was generously donated and sold for a very low price by Boston's former mayor, Tom Menino. Oh. And this one is also operated by the Muslim American Society and the Islamic Society of North America. Now, this mosque is frequently a host to a preacher named, of uh, imam rather, Abdullah Farooq. You want to know why Abdullah Farouk is important in this story? Is, well, he's infamous in the area. Now, Farouk's regular assignment is this mosque that's on the top two floors above a Somali grocery store on Shalmet Street, about four blocks from the Muslim American Society Mosque at Roxbury Crossing. So this is Roxbury also? This is the one, that, this is the mosque for the praising of Allah. This nice, real huge building here, not that one, this one is the one that's at Roxbury Crossing. And incidentally, it's across the street from a Somali cafe called the Butterfly Cafe. I had an occasion to meet the guy who runs the place, but there's, that's another story too. Abdullah Farouk is infamous in the Boston area. This is where he works, but he preaches at the other mosque frequently. This is Mr. Farouk. Now I have an interesting story about why this guy is important. I interviewed Mr. Farouk, and we sat knee to knee, very close, interviewing me initially about 2009. And the reason for the occasion for this interview was his mosque was also the host of a fellow named Tariq Mahana. Does anybody know who he is? He was the guy that was busted in September of 2009 for trying to buy guns to take a terrorist plot to go visit the Natick Mall. And the FBI stopped him in time and arrested Mahana. Now, I went to interview Mr. Farouk about this. And he was saying, oh, well, just Mahana, Tariq Mahana, I mean, he never gave me any trouble. He never gave me any reason to suspect that he was up to anything. He was a model pharmacy student at his school. And I was thinking, of course he was. Is he the one, excuse me, in Framingham? 
Hmm? There was someone in framing him that was accused that was Muslim. Is this the same well, one? Mahana, one? One of Mahana's confederates lived in Framingham. So this was a plot. But these guys went to the mosque frequented by and preached at by this Mr. Mr. Abdullah Farouk, our friend here. Now, Farouk is infamous, and here's why. In a September day in 2010, he was videoed at the Roxbury Crossing Mosque preaching the favorite Islamic topic of jihad. And he was caught on video, and I happen to know the guys that snuck in there with the camera and caught Mr. Farouk on video. Now, I ended up interviewing him about that, too. And he said, no, 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 I was trying to tell those people to be the best Muslims they can be. Take note of the yeah. fact that he was not telling them to be the best best American citizens they can be, or they were. he wasn't telling them to be the best person they can be. He was advocating that they be the best Muslims they can be. And at the same time, he was saying there are several types of jihad. There's jihad with the sword and the gun, and there's jihad with the pen. And he claimed he was advocating that they participate in jihad with the pen. Now, I had my friend Robert Spencer, who's an Islamic analyst, mm -hmm. listen to the recording of my interview with Mr. Farouk. And Mr. Farouk, according to Mr. Spencer's analysis, was doing what they call Islamic doublespeak or inverting reality. You know what inverting reality is? It's saying something is true when exactly the opposite is true. Is that like Boston Strong? Yeah, sort of like Boston Strong. Thank you. <laughs> and so here he is <laughs> preaching. I like it. Preaching jihad, telling them to be the best Muslims they can be, and to advocate them to take up the cause of jihad. And we'll get more into that later. Now, I think I've already covered all of that. But it's also, the other word that they call for Islamic, or inversion of reality, is another Islamic term. And it's according to Islamic law. Now, I want to show you. Islamic law is detailed in, vividly in this book called Reliance of the Traveler. It's the most important exposition of Islamic law you will ever find. And it was written by an imam named Ahmad ibn Naqib al-Misri. This guy died in like 1346. But this is still their Islamic law manual. And in it, they tell you that takia is perfectly legitimate. You know what that is? Lying. It's lying. Oh. It's a very nice scholarly Arabic word for lying. And it says that you can lie to infidels. By the way, that's us. <laughs> We're all infidels, according to the Muslims. Now... And I was, uh, let's see, now, now the top photo here is Tariq Mahana, the fellow that was bagged by the FBI in 2009. The bottom two, we all know, are Tamerlan and Jokar Sanaev. Why was Abdullah Farouk and his jihad preaching important? It's because he knew Mr. Farouk was acquainted with both Jokar and Tamerlan Sarnaya. Thank you for that. Have a nice night. Yeah. Now, about Mahana and the Sarnaya brothers. Farouk denied they could have done such a thing in the interview. He said, no, it's not possible. Now, at the same time... So that was a lie. That was a lie. <laughs> There's a rumor going now around on Facebook and other places that these two guys, Jokar and Tamerlan Sarnayev, were refugees. That's not quite the truth. They came here on a tourist visa with their parents when they were 8 to 10 years old. They overstayed the visa, and then they claimed refugee status. Oh. And they were granted refugee status afterwards. However, that, that little bit of misinformation is circulating to try to blunt the idea of uh, our U.S. policymakers allowing in all of the refugees from the Middle East. And by the way, have you seen any of the photographs of these large crowds of refugees coming? Yes. 
And what well, are, all men. They're mostly men yeah. between the ages Overseas, of 18 and 40. No yeah. So it's they're not sad, familyless refugees. They're what the Nazis called fifth colonists being brought into the country. Now, they were brought here as kids. And of course, everybody says they were model children. They just got disillusioned with their new host country. And if anybody recognizes these two people, these are Tamerlan's uncle, father, Asnor, and Zubiat, Zubidat, their mother. Now, after the bombing, both of them had that press conference back in Chechnya, because they left the country, right, right. amazingly enough. And they said, I just can't believe that my two sons would have done such a thing. Now, later, in the next press conference, that's when you have Zubidat coming out saying, absolutely, I fully supported my sons in their terrorist act. <clears throat> and that's her sneering at all the people who had the audacity to ask the question. Now, there, are, there was an interesting story going around shortly after the Boston bombing that there was a Saudi Arabian national connected with the attack. Now, while I was working for World Net Daily, since I was freelance, I was also a correspondent for the radio network, the Salem Radio Network, SRN News, a largely Christian radio network. So that night, on the night of the 15th, after the bombing took place, I said, okay, I gotta go check this out. This is too good to miss. So I went on into Boston, and I was blocked somewhere around down Commonwealth Avenue. But I got stopped there, and I got out of my car, parked, and went around, and I found a policeman. And the policeman was, you know, a really nice guy, Boston police sergeant. And I said, well, what's going on? You know, you know, tell me what's going on. And he mentioned to me, he said, we have arrested a Saudi national and have detained him because he was injured at the bombing site. Him. That's him. Yeah. And I know where he went. Because they said, well, I think the Boston sergeant, who wouldn't tell me his name for obvious reasons, so he on the radio report says, a Boston police officer who asked not to be identified, mm -hmm. it told me that a Saudi national has been detained as a suspect in the Boston bombing. And I found out he was at Brigham and Women's Hospital. So the next day, not to be outdone, I drove to Brigham and Women's Hospital, wow. parked, parked, a couple of, parked a couple of blocks away, went through, and there were policemen everywhere, and I didn't have any of my media regalia on, on purpose, because I thought, well, they'll, they wouldn't let me in the building. But you've got the collar. Oh, I didn't wear the collar then. Oh. I was wearing civilian clothes. Oh, mm -hmm. the and I went right up to the seventh floor, got off the elevator, looked down the hall, and there's an armed guard in front of the room where the Saudi national is kept. Wow. Now, why is this important? Two days later, John Kerry, negotiated to allow the Saudi national suspect to return home, questions unasked. And so he was let go, and he's out of the country. And so, and my son was telling me last night, Dad, don't ever throw away that reporter's note where you have that down. I said, wait a minute. I have actual material evidence that the United States government was complicit in no knowledge of the Saudi involvement with the Boston bombing. I think I might want to get rid of that. Because <laughs> it might attract too much attention at some point. But anyway, that's my little story about that, too. Now, much, with, much was written about our dear Tsarnaev brothers, about coming to the U.S. and having broken dreams and feeling rejected and all of those other sad stories. But the real story is this. They were determined followers of Islam. <clears throat> now, here's an, an amazing irony or double you know, an anachronism, if you will, or whatever, paradox about Islam. What we want is for Muslims not to get serious about their faith. And I'll talk more about that later. What we really want is Christians to get really, really serious about their faith, because that's where things change when Christians become serious about their Christian faith. Things change too when Muslims get excited, but we'll talk about that in a second. What they did... I want everybody to know they did for theological reasons. Now, here's something everyone needs to know about the Middle East. And this will help you understand everything that's going on there. 
true. Islam and Muslims cannot ever accept Israel's right to exist. And the reason they cannot is because if Muslims accept Israel's right to exist, they have to also accept Israel's claim to the land. Are you following me? If they accept Israel's claim to the land, theologically that means they have to accept that Isaac was the son of the promise. Because it was promised to the Jews through Isaac, not Ishmael. Ishmael. And Ishmael is the one that the Muslims believed that from whom they are descended. So if they accept Israel's right to exist, they are denying one of the major components of their doctrine. And they cannot do that. They will not. You cannot be a faithful Muslim and believe that Israel has a right to exist. Otherwise, you are undermining the entire basis of who you are. Because Muslims claim to be sons of Ishmael. Because the Quran says that Abraham and Ishmael <coughs> went and rebuilt the Kaaba in Mecca. There's no archaeological evidence to support that, but they believe it anyway. So, there you go. You have the Middle East in a nutshell. There won't be any peace there until Jesus actually comes back. And he won't say he's a Muslim when he returns, as the, as the Muslims do, but I'll get to that. I'm getting ahead of myself here. So, what do Muslims actually believe? And what did the Sarnayev brothers believe? Well, here's a summary of Islamic beliefs. The key to understanding this issue is how you define terms. First, Islam sees the world in two major camps. There is the Dar al-Islam and the Dar al-Harq. The sphere of Islam and the sphere of war. We all live in either one of those two camps. You either live in the sphere of Islam or you live in the sphere of war. We, by the way, are in the sphere of war. <laughs> Muslims group everybody by two categories. You're either a Muslim, well actually there's, there are broad expansions on each category, you are either a Muslim or if you are an infidel or a non-Muslim, you have to agree to live as a demi. Anybody know what a demi is? A second class citizen. If you are demi in a Muslim country with an Islamic regime, you are going to have to pay what they call the jizya, the tax, and you have to agree to live under the restrictions that they're going to impose upon you, which is you can breathe, you can multiply, and I don't mean two times two is four, <laughs> but you cannot do anything that aggravates the Muslim order, and you cannot evangelize if you are a Christian. Otherwise, they will burn down your church. Now, there are the Muslims, the al al dima which is non-Muslims agreeing to live in, as second-class citizens, the Muharrabim, the criminals, and the Bugat, the rebels. Then there are the groups under the Dar al-Harb, that's infidels. And then they have this, remember I talked about how it's how you define the terms, what they call non-combatants. But, no one is a non-combatant. If you are an infidel, you are not a non-combatant. That's the reason they can legitimize torturing and killing women, children, beheading people, and they're putting videos of it on the, on the internet. Because you are an infidel, and you are therefore a non-combatant. Also, when I was covering what was going on in Egypt with their former Muslim Brotherhood president, who has been since arrested and thrown out of office, remember, uh, what's his name, Mohammed Morsi? Yeah. They started a campaign to burn down churches and drive Christians out of the country. All of the human rights activists raised a ruckus <laughs> about it, like they should have. They said, that's persecution. But the Muslim Islamic government at the time in Egypt said, no, 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 no. we're not persecuting anybody. Persecution can only be enacted on Muslims in Islamic law and thought. 
if you are an infidel and a non-Muslim, you are not being persecuted, you're only getting what you rightly deserve. And that's how they could legitimately get away with and justify chasing the Christians out of their country, burning the churches, and all these other things. Now, the condition of Demi is that you live as a second-class citizen. You will pay the jizya, and you will live with severe religious restrictions. Now, Islamic beliefs, the creed, there's five pillars of Islam. The creed, and I'm not going to say it because it's basically what you say to convert to Islam, so I'm not going to say that. You're just going to have to look it up. There's the salat, or prayer. There's almsgiving, which is the zakat. Now, this is another tricky thing about Islamic law. The zakat is outlined in great detail in Reliance of the Traveler. However, there's another book called The Ideal Muslim Society that says the zakat can be collected from your mosque. And if you are a attender of a mosque and you do not pay the zakat, they can come after you and beat you up and spill your blood. It, it's in the book here. The Ideal Muslim Society by Dr. Muhammad Ali al-Hashimi. So, here's something else you need to know about the zakat. All of those Muslims that say they do not support j jihad are not quite telling you the truth. Because the zakat, as it's divided up after they collect it, a portion of all the zakat from every mosque in the United States, which by the way, 80% of the mosques in the United States are funded by the Saudi government, the zakat is dedicated to jihad. So every Muslim who attends and gives their zakat at their mosque is supporting jihad, knowingly and willingly. Even though they'll come out and you see that nice Muslim family at the corner and all this, they go to their prayers once a week on Friday afternoon and they pay their zakat. And they'll say, no, we, are, we just want to live in peace. Well, they do. But it's their definition of peace. And guess what that is? The world united under an Islamic state. That's their definition of peace. Remember, the key to winning an argument is how you define the terms. And if you can define the terms and hold the argument on your grounds, right. you're going to win. And so they can say, well, we want peace, and Islam is a religion of peace. <laughs> but it's an Islamic, but they're, remember, their definition of peace is the world united under an Islamic state governed by Sharia law. Right. Jihad is in here. It, letter O, 9.0. Jihad is covered very in great detail in this book. Now, then the other part, fasting and the Hajj, the pilgrimages. Now, remember, the ultimate purpose for the building blocks of the five pillars of Islam is to train a Muslim to be able to carry out the one major obligation of Islam. Does anybody know what the one major obligation of Islam is? I've already been talking about it. Jihad. 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 Anybody know who Anjum Chowdhury is? The British Islamic cleric who was on with Sean Hannity on the Fox News channel. Oh, and, and before that, he was on with Elliot Spitzer, before some of Elliot Spitzer's more salty acti activities were revealed. Spitzer and Parker, when they was... Chowdhury was on there, and he is the real deal. Mm -hmm. He and his friend, Omar Bakri Muhammad, in Britain, founded a group called Al-Muhajarun. It's a jihad group. Now, where am I going? I'm going I'm to get to this in a minute. Al-Muhajarun, well, Bakri, Omar Bakri Muhammad was deported from Britain for advocating terrorism. And, but Al-Muhajarun was the group... Who, one of whose members is the one who beheaded the British soldier in the street. So they're having actual jihad taking place in England right now. But Mr. Chowdhury told me numerous times on telephone interviews, and I still have his phone number plugged into my cell phone. It's right here. The foreign policy of every Islamic country is jihad. Muslims do not recognize national boundaries. Muslims do not recognize the legitimacy of non-Islamic regimes. And all true, genuine Muslims do not believe in the Constitution of the United States. They do not believe in anybody else's law because they believe that Sharia is divine God's law. Period. End of discussion. Now, by the time I hung up listening to Mr. Chowdhury ramble on for a few minutes, I was going, <gasps> you know, 
because this guy's telling me this over the telephone, and I'm thinking, and he was really nice about it. <laughs> He's telling me he wants to have my head, but he was really polite. He would say, excuse me, before he beheaded me. <laughs> now, so we already talked about the law of reliance of the traveler here. Now let's talk about takia, lying for the expansion of Islam. In Surah 328, in the Quran. Anybody know anything about the Quran? Besides the fact of what I already told you that's properly spelled with a Q. It is organized in, one, there's about 147, 140 surahs. It's divided by surahs, <coughs> chapters. And it is organized with the longest surah first down to the shortest. Now, the Quran is also organized in such a way that you can't follow the context of where it's going. You know in the Bible, if you look in the Bible, it's roughly in chronological order. You go from Genesis all the way up through Esther, and then the prophets are roughly organized in whether they're major prophets and before the exile, and the other minor prophets after the exile in Babylon, and then the New Testament is the Gospels, and then Acts, and then Revelation comes at the end, roughly in chronological order. When you look up a Bible verse, you can always see the context of it. Right. You can't do that with the Quran. It is not in any particular order. And that's to their advantage. <coughs> Throwing everybody off. Because you can't get a context on what it says. There is no historical context. There is no literary context. The stuff is just shoved in there in some kind of random order. Anyway, Surah 328 in the Quran tells Muslims they're not to make friends with non-Muslim people. And by the way, the surahs are coming in two types in the Quran. There's the Mecca surahs and the Medina surahs. The Medina surahs were written by Muhammad after he got kicked out of Mecca. Because the people in Mecca didn't like his religion, so they threw him out. And Mecca surahs were the ones where he talks about peace and love and brotherhood and harmony and all these good things. The Medina surahs are when he was starting his military campaign. And the last surah composed for the Quran was surah number 9, which has been labeled the surah of the sword. That's the one that has this lovely verse in it that says, And when the days of holy obligation are ended, slay the infidels where you find them. Lie and wait for them in every strategy of war. Lovely, isn't it? Kill the infidels. That's what it says. But Surah 328 says you can't make friends with non-Muslims. But you can do takia, which is you can make the people think they are your friend, so you can save your neck, even though they aren't really your friend. And it's in there. It's in the Quran. PhD scholar Don Boyce wrote about the Quran in a variety of verses. He says, the Quran in a variety of verses, ver chapter 2, verse 225, Surah 3, verse 28, Surah 3, verse 54, Surah 9, verse 3, Surah 16, 106. Surah 40, verse 28, and Surah 66, verse 2, establishes the religious legitimacy of breaking oaths, lying, unilaterally violating treaties, and generally scheming against non-Muslims. Allah himself is described as the best of schemers. That's, uh... Now, Muhammad used this as a means of killing people who, to whom he had promised safe passage. Because Muhammad said, war is deceit. So it was okay to behead the infidels. Now, that we talked about the Quran a little bit. Again, it has, excuse me, it has 114 surahs, chapters called surahs. We've already talked about the Bible. And I mentioned the two types of surahs in the Quran. The Medina, or the Mecca surahs, which came first, and the Medina. But you don't know which ones are which unless you study it. However, Here's the thing about Islamic theology. They have the principle called abrogation. Does anybody know what that means? To do away with our... Anybody ever been in the military? Yeah. Where you see, this publication supersedes the same publication of an earlier number. That's what that means. The Mecca, the Medina Surahs, according to Islamic theology, supersede and abrogate the, Medina, the Mecca Surahs. Which means all the peace, love, and brotherhood stuff, you're going to use that for the infidels, 
And you're gonna really believe all the Medina surahs because that's where all this is eventually going. The Hadiths are held to be an equal authority to the Quran and one of them written by Bukhari, volume 9, book 84, verse 64 says, Whenever I tell you a narration from Allah's apostle, Muhammad, by Allah, I would rather fall down from the sky than ascribe a false statement to him. But if I tell you something between me and you, not a Hadith, then it was indeed a trick. I must, may say things just to cheat my enemy. That's Islamic theology. Then there's the Sharia law, Reliance of the Traveler, section R, chapter 8, verse 2, page 744, that says, Scholars say that there is no harm in giving a misleading impression if required by an interest countenanced by sacred law that is more important than not misleading the person being addressed or if there is a pressing need which could not otherwise be fulfilled except through lying. Now, let's move on to that wonderful subject of jihad. Again, section O, 9.0 of Reliance of the Traveler, says it is the main struggle, and it's the obligation of every Muslim. There are, and one of the things I was going to show on the slide presentation is this map of the United States, with all the little spots on it. Everybody see the little spots there? Yeah. <coughs> Do you know what those are? Mm, Spaces Muslim. of operation. Those are the locations of Muslim training camps in the United States that are allowed to exist by our FBI. They know that they're training. They have shooting ranges on them. They're Muslim communities. There is even one in Texas, if you can believe it, not 20 miles from where I grew up around Houston. Those are Muslim training camps. Now, the doctrine of jihad is the driving force behind Islam. And here's why. In Islam, and make sure you get this, there is no guarantee of salvation in Islam. In, in the Bible, it says, believe in Jesus and you will be saved. Pretty straightforward. There is no such guarantee in Islam. You can be a faithful Muslim and live by those five pillars of Islam your entire life, but if Allah has not decreed that you are going to paradise, you are not going. But he's deceitful. Yes, Allah, remember, is the best schemer of all. But it's, everything is by Allah's decrees. So, if he has decreed you ain't going to paradise, you can be the best Muslim you can be, according to Farouk's preaching. You can follow the five pillars of Islam, you can give to charity, you can do your zakat, you can do all these other things, but you're still going to fry. Putting it lightly. Oh, so they have, they fry? No, I mean, in hell. I mean, they have a hell? Yes, they believe in that. I just have only heard about them. They believe that they're, they believe lots of people are going there. Now here's the thing, the only guarantee of salvation in Islam is to die in jihad. This book is a book written by a man named Saeed Qutub. Milestones. This is what documents the, the Muslims' progress in their faith towards jihad and towards the point of being willing to give their lives on the field of battle promoting jihad. That's okay, I'm coming back this way. And this book was found in the backpack of almost every Muslim soldier killed in the Iraqi war and Afghanistan war. Every one of them believed this. Now, Saeed Qutub was a protege of Hassan al-Banna. Remember who he was earlier from the early? Hassan al-Banna started the Muslim Brotherhood. Saeed Qutub was his student. By the way, Nasser's regime in Egypt hung Saeed Qutub in 1966 because Nasser was more allied with Moscow than he was with Mecca. <laughs> One of the best things in the world about the Egyptians and their relationship with the Soviet Union. But they hung Saeed Qutub. However, Qutub was managed to write this book, which is the inspiration. And every adult that goes to the madrasa, the Islamic school at their mosque learns and studies milestones. All those nice Muslims that live on the corner in house or whatever, 
They all go to their mosque and they study Sayyid Qutub's book. And if you have any doubts about the, the violence of what we're talking about here, this book is written by a guy named Brigadier S.K. Malik, a retired brigadier of the Pakistani army. And in this book, he nicely says the Quran is the perfect model of a war, a manual for war. So, that explains why jihad is their most pressing obligation. It's the only way they can guarantee paradise. And yes, they believe that 72 virgins await them. That's for the men. What freaks me out is how you are going to get a woman to blow herself up in jihad because they have no same guarantee of 72 virgins waiting for them right. of some sort on the other side. <laughs> 72 However, <laughs> pair of shoes. Yeah, maybe 72 <laughs> pairs of shoes or something. Or a new burqa, I don't know. Oh, <laughs> anyway, here's another thing you need to keep in mind. The, Muslim, the supposed moderate Muslims do not really exist. That's part of the taqiyya. Now, has anybody heard of a guy named Tariq Ramadan? He wrote a book called Western Muslims and the Future of Islam. He's fawned over by the media. Everybody trots him out all the time. You know, CNN, he's on there all the time. But guess what? He's a deceiver. He is, because Tariq Ramadan is the grandson of Hassan al-Banna, oh. the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, how moderate do you think this guy really is? Oh. Wow. He is not. Now, how many of you know who this guy is? The dude in the picture. His name is Fatula Gulen. You need to know who this is. He is a Turk. He's the one who founded the Justice Party that's governing in Turkey now. He owns most of the newspapers in Turkey. But guess what? He doesn't live in Turkey. He lives in a well-guarded compound in Sailorsville, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Because the United States, he brought, he came in claiming to be an educator. And he got a visa to stay because he was a necessary person. Because he's an educator. And guess what Futula Gulen has done? He started a network all over the country of charter schools. Oh, wait a minute, a network of charter schools all over the country. And there happens to be one, the Pioneer Academy of Science and Math in Medford. And what they do is teach his, glorify Islam. They soften the students' perceptions of Islam. And the number one honor student at the Gulen schools, the Pioneer Academy, they get awarded at graduation a trip to Turkey so they can tour the country. Now, Gulen is under investigation for fraud and various things and income tax evasion and all that other stuff, but I don't, don't hold your breath on him going to prison. But his network of schools is a billion dollar industry in the United States. They have them all over. They call it the Daisy Foundation, or the Peace Foundation, or all these other kinds of nice sounding names. There's a chain of them in Colorado, and like I said, there's one in Medford. They're all over. Now, they've also been able to influence the Latin and Ringe Academy in Cambridge. No. So, can I ask you a question? don't send any of your kids there. Is, can I ask you a question? Is some of this influence, because once I read this, coming from Harvard, is some of this influence coming from Harvard? Because I know. Oh, of course, because the Saudi, Saudi government's Arabia. funded several schools at Harvard. The John F. Kennedy School of Government, for one, I think. Don't quote me on that. But I believe they, they have given large amounts of money. The Foreign Studies School at Georgetown University is now funded by the United Arab Emirates and the Saudi government. Georgetown University, that famous school for foreign, foreign affairs is now being bought off, well, excuse me, funded <laughs> by generous donations from Arabs. They're funding Common Core, too, by the way. Wouldn't oh. doubt it. Now, here's something else we got to look out here. And I, got, and I brought the books to show you. Anybody know who Yahya Emmerich is? <laughs> no. No, I didn't think so. He's the author of this book. The Complete Idiot's Guide to Understanding Islam. Yahya Emmerich was a student at Michigan State University, where else? Michiganistan. And he went, to, he got converted to Islam, and now he's written this very nice book telling all of us how wonderful and how peace-loving 
Muslims are. Islam is a religion of peace, etc., etc., and all that other stuff. Now, Yahya Emmerich is also the author of this book, What Islam is All About. This is the book that's used as the seventh to ninth grade textbook in the Islamic schools in the United States, which, by the way, most of the mosques are funded by the Saudis. In this book, they tell you Islam is incompatible with any other governmental system. And jihad is the obligation of every Muslim. Jihad is not just an inner struggle to overcome your foibles. Jihad is war against the infidels. This is what they teach one another. But Yahya Emmerich wrote this book too. What does this tell you? It tells you, well, it's takia. This is what they tell the infidels. And this is what they tell one another. Right under our noses. Did you put it up to that camera? Excuse me? I want to make sure you showed it up to that camera. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> make me do a close up here. Right. Real close up. This book, both books were written by the same man, the convert to Islam in the 1990s as a student at Michigan State University. And it's Takia at its finest. You'd come out of this believing that Muslims are all just warm and fuzzy. But here's what they really teach one another in their schools. And that's why in Minneapolis, so many of the Somali immigrants there have signed on to go back to Somalia to become part of Al-Shabaab. They were recruited right out of the schools in the mosques. And that's what's going on right under our noses. So you, an infidel can convert to being to Islam? Well, an infidel can convert, and then you're, you're all right then. If you convert and become one of the boys, you're just fine. Or one of the ladies, as the case may be. Now, so what does the Quran teach us about Jesus? Because that's the major part of the rest of what I want to talk about. The Quran tells us that Jesus was not crucified. In Surah 4, 157. The Quran tells us that he was no more than an apostle in Surah 4, verse 171. That he was not the Son of God, Surah 4, verse 30. And that his mission was limited, Surah 13, verse 38. So, of course, they deny that Jesus is anything more than just a prophet, a really religious man, officially. Now, interestingly enough, the Quran also will teach us that Jesus was righteous. Surah 6, verse 85. Jesus was born of a virgin. Surah 19, verse 22. Jesus came in fulfillment of prophecy. Surah 4, verse 171. He was sent with the gospel. Surah 5, verse 49. He taught no false worship. Surah 5, verse 119. He was Messiah. Yes, Messiah. Surah 3, verse 44. He was amazing. Surah 19, verse 27. He did miracles. Surah 3, verse 48. And also, there's a verse in the Quran that actually says Jesus was the Word of God. Surah 3, verse 45. So I ask you, why do the Muslims follow Muhammad? <laughs> Their own book tells them Jesus was perfect. Mm -hmm. He was sinless. He performed miracles. And they also say he's coming again. But they don't believe that he died and was they, they don't believe he died and rose again. But here's the thing. They got the perfect dude, Jesus, in their book. And the Quran also teaches that Muhammad was a sinner needing repentance. Muhammad did no miracles. Muhammad is dead. Well, they believe he's taken to heaven. And Muhammad is not coming back. Thank God. Anyway, <laughs> that's an aside. But they say that Jesus was perfect. So again, why are they following Muhammad and not Jesus? And my wife has the perfect answer to that. They're deceived. It's spiritual deception. Wrought upon their psyche by... You know who. Now, what does the Bible teach us about Jesus? Well, Jesus was born of a virgin. Isaiah 7.14, Luke 1.34. 
His birth was prophesied, Genesis 3.15, Deuteronomy 18.15, 2 Samuel 7, verses 11 through 15, Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, Jeremiah 25, 20 verse, 23, verse 5, and Hosea chapter 11. To name he, a few. Just to name a few. <laughs> Jesus was perfect and sinless, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. He made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. He was crucified, Psalm 22. Read that. Read Psalm 22 one time, and it will be eerily familiar, because it sounds like David was actually watching the crucifixion and writing this stuff down, because in Psalm 22, David prophesied that they would gamble for his clothes. And it starts out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's what Jesus said from the cross. And it also, the Bible tells us Jesus took away our sin, and there's lots of verses for that as our friend over there said, among others. I could give you a long list. Jesus was and is <coughs> eternal, the Son of Man, Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. He's eternal, the Word, John 1, 1 through 14, Philippians 2, 5 through 10, Colossians 1, 15 to 20, among others. He claimed divinity for himself. Don't ever let anybody tell you Jesus never claimed to be God. I am the Father of what? Before he ever was born, I am. You're taking away part of my lecture. <laughs> okay. Mark 2, verses 10 and 11. So that you may know the Son of Man on earth has authority to forgive sins. That was after the Pharisees were thinking in their minds. And Jesus knew what they were thinking. He said, only God can forgive sins. But guess what? Jesus didn't dispute that. But he says, so that you will know the Son of Man has authority to forgive sin. Then, Mark 2, verse 28. The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Because the Sabbath was created at creation. And he's claiming to be the creator. Then, oh, there's all those great John passages. John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. John 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am. John 10, verses 11, I am the good shepherd and I am the door. And John 10, verse 30, I am the father of one. So, don't believe that stuff about Jesus not claiming divinity for himself. He was pretty in your face about it, saying, hey, I'm God, he said. Believe me, that's Jesus. That's a quote from Jesus. I'm not claiming that. And that he will return. He rose from the grave. Hosea 6, true. Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, John 20. Jesus came out of that tomb. And he was empty. And then he will return. Zechariah 12, 10. Zechariah 14, 4 through 8. Matthew 24, verse 44. Acts 1, verse 11. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. <laughs> James 5, 8. 2 Peter 3, 10. 1 John 3. Hey, I'm a preacher. I'm getting going here. Yeah. <laughs> 1, John, 1 John 3, 2. And Revelation 22, 20. Those are only a few of the verses that tell us who Jesus really is. And so what I want to end with tonight is we spent a lot of time talking about Islam and what it is and what it... Unfortunately, what it is. And again, a little bit about what Islam says about Jesus. But I want you to know, and I want to leave this with you. Trust in Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And if you want victory in your life, you don't have to die in jihad. Mm. If you want victory over sin, you don't have to die in jihad. And you don't need to worry about whether or not there are 72 virgins waiting for you because what's waiting for you on the other side is even so much better than that and it's mind-blowing beyond all comprehension on what heaven is going to be like. So put your faith and trust in Jesus. And here's the other thing. Become convicted enough about your faith in Christ to start praying for the conversion of that Muslim cashier at the gas station. That's right. Amen. Start praying for the conversion of that Muslim cab driver. Start praying for the conversion of that Muslim who's doing whatever. The one on the corner. Pray for that Muslim that's serving your coffee at Dunkin' Donuts. What is the penalty under Islam for converting to Christianity? Death. Okay. Yeah. Death. <laughs> that's Surah 2. Conversion, if you convert... That's it. You're an infidel, and you're even worse than an infidel. See, infidels were already bad guys. If you convert away from Islam to Christianity, you become then an apostate. So are there examples of that being enforced here in America? Well, I don't know. I mean, the, the num numerous beheadings and things, the honor killings, you're too worldly. 
that's that's why this uh, this gal ran away from her family in Florida. I can't remember her name right now. And it went to Ohio. Back, yeah. So, you know, I'll take any other questions. Well, we'll close formally. Then we'll have questions afterwards. Then, okay. okay. So let's give a nice hand to. Uh,